This podcast is made possible thanks to donations from lovely listeners, and you can click a yellow PayPal button on the website if you're feeling generous. And also the premium subscription, which costs you per month slightly less than a pack of 80 Yorkshire Gold tea bags from Sainsbury's, that's a supermarket in England. So if you'd like to make sure that I never run out of tea, then you could consider signing up to Luke's English Podcast. Premium, Luke's English Podcast Premium, not just Luke's English Podcast. There are now well over 100 audio and video episodes in the archive, and you can access them all, plus new ones that are coming. That's what you get when you become a premium Lepster. To get all the information, including how it works and exactly how wonderfully reasonable the prices are, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners. How are you today? You're doing all right? All things considered, it's a tricky time, isn't it? Um, I do hope that you are managing to keep calm and uh, carry on during this weird and difficult period of history that we're all experiencing. So, shall we start the episode? Yeah? Okay. Here is the second in a series of interviews I've been doing lately, featuring people I've been meaning to talk to on the podcast for quite a while. Quite a while, that's one of those expressions in English that's a bit vague, isn't it? Quite a while, is that a long time or a short time? Well, the quick answer is quite a while means a long time. So interviews with people I've been meaning to talk to on the podcast for quite a long time. I just wanted to record natural conversations with some new guests so you can hear their voices, their stories, their thoughts, so you can notice bits of language and practice your English listening as usual. The first of these recent interviews was with Marie Connolly from Australia, which was the last episode, of course. I hope you all enjoyed that. This conversation is with a friend of mine called Elspeth, who's from England. Elspeth is an English teacher, and she does some stand-up comedy in the evenings, uh, just like me, and that's how we met each other, through doing stand-up. She's another English teaching comedian friend of mine. I've got quite a few of those. So the title of this episode is Chasing the Tangent Train with Elspeth. The title is just a metaphor. Please don't expect a conversation about train travel. And I know now there are some train enthusiasts going, oh, what you mean? This isn't about chasing an actual train? No, that's just a metaphor to explain the fact that this conversation is full of tangents. And I hope that you can keep up with it. In fact, it's mainly tangents. What's a tangent, Luke? Well, long-term listeners should know this, but plenty of people won't know. So let me explain. In a conversation, a tangent is when the topic changes to something quite different and seemingly not related to the main point of that conversation. It's when you digress from the main point, go away from the main topic, or get sidetracked to go off on a tangent. So there are lots of tangents in this conversation. So for the title of the episode, I was trying to think of a way to describe the experience that you will have of just following the changes in direction in a conversation and seeing where it goes. I ended up with chasing the train, which is not actually an expression you will find in the dictionary, okay? I made it up. Um, Let's imagine then that this conversation is a train and it's going down the tracks... Let's imagine that this conversation is a train and it's going down the tracks and every now and then it switches to new tracks and it continues for a while in a different direction and then it switches to another new track and then it and then it does it again and again and again and so on. Basically, can you keep up with the train? You're following but you're trying to follow the train, you see. You're behind the train on one of those hand cars with a handle that you pump up and down in order to try and keep up with it. And you're trying to keep... Yeah, uh, the, the metaphor doesn't work very well, but I think you get the idea. My overall aim for this interview was mainly to get to know Elspeth in more depth and to capture an authentic conversation to help you learn English. That's the destination for this train journey. But as I said, the topics move around quite a bit, which is totally normal in a conversation. Just ask David Crystal. He wrote a book all about it, and he's a professor, and he definitely knows what he's talking about. 
What I'm getting at is that this might be hard for you to follow depending on your level of English, so you'll have to focus. Nevertheless, I can help you keep up with this if I let you Nevertheless, I can help you keep up with this if I let you know what the main changes will be in advance. So I'm now going to give you a quick overview of the main changes in topic in this chat. Okay? And by the way, the word chat, it doesn't just refer to text conversations. These days people use the word chat to mean text conversations, but a chat is also just a an oral conversation too. So the main points in this conversation are thus. And by the way, these aren't spoilers, okay? So we talk about where Elspeth comes from originally and how her family moved around parts of England. We talk about being the daughter of a vicar, and that's her, not me, obviously. Um, In case you're wondering, a vicar is a priest in the Anglican Church, the Church of England. The cliché of the typical English vicar is that they wear black with a little white collar, just just like most priests, and they're often softly spoken grey-haired men with glasses who ride bicycles around their parish and love drinking tea, eating cake and generally worshipping God. So we talk also about our accents, which are not strongly affected by the region where we grew up, and we actually come from the same general area in England. We talk about having harvest festivals at church when we were children, Then there's a big random tangent, uh, and that's remembering the old dial telephones we had in our houses when we were children. Do you remember those? Younger listeners won't know, but um, the older ones will. Dial telephones. These are telephones where you had to put your finger in, you, you put your finger into a dial and turn the numbers around, and it kind of went... It made a, made that noise as you turned the numbers around. That's how you dialed the numbers. You don't remember? Well, that must be because you're young or you're you're just very old and you've lost your memory. I don't know. But anyway, we talk about dial telephones. We talk about services that you could get on those old analog uh, telephones, like, for example, the operator. That's a person who you could speak to and who would deal with your telephone-related inquiries. And... Um, And also the talking clock. That's a recorded voice that was constantly telling the time and you could call a number and listen to it. Then we talk about Coventry Cathedral in Coventry, which was almost destroyed during World War II, but was rebuilt and is now definitely worth a visit if you're in the city. Uh, We talk about Elspeth's life in France, her French, and whether or not she feels French or English after living here for quite a long time some of the cultural differences between England and France that frustrate us a bit, like the usual things, being punctual, walking down the street, and in particular, queuing, standing in line to wait for things in public. Teaching English to young engineers and the challenges that French students have when learning English. Some of Elspeth's experiences of learning French. How Elspeth can behave slightly differently in English and in French, especially when doing stand-up comedy in the two languages. Elspeth's thoughts on her own clothing choices and fashion sense, and how people react to it, especially the Nike Air Max trainers that she wears. Teaching English online using Zoom and what that is like. Doing stand-up comedy, which is obviously going on stage and telling people jokes and stories to make them laugh, and Elspeth's favourite and least favourite things about doing that, where her inspiration for comedy material comes from, and flow activities or being in a flow state. We talk about if there is a connection between stand-up and English teaching. There's a little story about the Teletubbies that Elspeth uses in her English lessons, which makes the students laugh. The Teletubbies, by the way, is a children's TV show. The story involves the Teletubbies, William Shakespeare, the county of Warwickshire in England, and April Fool's Day. Basically, the county council of Warwickshire played an April Fool's trick on the people of Warwickshire, and it involved the Teletubbies and Shakespeare, and people didn't like it. We talk about why English people get into rages. A rage. Why do English people get into rages sometimes? Like road rage or trolley rage in the supermarket. There's the concept of French bashing, 
which is criticising or making fun of the French and French culture, and why Parisians, that's people living in Paris, why Parisians seem to complain about each other's behaviour quite a lot. We talk about how people's behaviour in public in Paris compares to behaviour in the UK and in Tokyo in Japan. We talk about things we love about France because there's a lot to love about this country too. And finally, there's a bit at the end where we both conclude that Paul Taylor is basically a cake, okay? A delicious British cake. Actually, reading out that list, it doesn't seem like there are that many tangents, but there are tangents, okay? What I've just given you there is the main flow of the conversation. Right then, so now that you've got an overview of the track layout. Let's get this train rolling. Let's just get started. Here's my conversation with Elspeth then, and here we go. Elspeth, hello. Welcome to my podcast. Uh, It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. A Brit to a Brit. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. Nice to have another Brit on the podcast. Yeah. Whereabouts are you from in in the UK? So I grew up, uh, well, my dad is a vicar. Oh, really? So we moved around quite a lot. Um, but so I was born in a place called Hitchin. Mm-hmm. Do you what? know it? It's in the north of London somewhere. Oh, yeah. Somewhere. I say that because we left when I was three. So I have no memories it's of actually, it. It's actually in Hertfordshire. Is it, oh, it's Hertfordshire. Yeah. Is that Greater London? Is it, is it part mm, of Greater Probably London? not even. No, it's a bit further out. But people, crazy people in England commute, don't they, from places like that to oh, yeah. London? Oh, yeah on a rickety old train <laughs> um okay hitch in here okay just sort of just outside luton yeah okay. as i said i have no recollection because we left when i was three and then we moved to coventry oh really yes lady godiva city Wait my, a minute. my dad was a canon at coventry cathedral seriously yeah wow hardcore wow Wait. he was actually a canon and another of the canons i think he was a canon was the father of the one of the specials i think it was yeah, cause because the, all that music scene came from Coventry. Yeah, the specials from Coventry, Coventry's finest. Yeah, uh, we have to add that I am a little bit older than Luke. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I was around when I was a teenager. These bands were big. Mm-hmm. So hold on a minute. There's lot of, already <laughs> this stuff to, to kind of um, talk about here. Uh, first of all, your, your father being a cannon. Now, some listeners are going, "What a cannon! Like what? At a, <laughs> like at a, on a pirate ship? That kind of cannon? Like well, that, well, that would be cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> that way, imagine if your father was actually. Yeah. A, 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 I wouldn't get any in, in, any problems at school, would I? Because I say, "Well, my dad's a cannon. That would shut them up, really, wouldn't it? It's like saying my dad's a Kalashnikov, <laughs> but Dave, bigger. Dave Kalashnikov. Um, <laughs> What is a canon then exactly? Oh, goodness. I didn't know I was going to get that question. Well, well canon is, I, I guess it's, um, ooh, sorry, Dad. It's a grade in for vicars, you know, so you, it affiliates you with a cathedral. Ah, right. I see. I don't think it's any more than that. I don't think you have to do exams to be a canon or anything. Anglican Church. Yeah, so Church of England. Yeah. So they are allowed to get married and have children. So I'm legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> and so are my two sisters and my brother. Yeah. Okay, and at Coventry Cathedral. So you lived in Coventry because we did. I'm yes. from near there as well. Are you? you? You've got a little accent, haven't you? I have haven't. I? Have I got a little accent? You think a little so? Little nasal. A little bit of a sort of maybe a little bit of a Midlands mm, kind of could kind well of thing be, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. People uh, used to think we were posh because we didn't have an accent where we lived. Yeah, I think people think I'm posh sometimes too because I don't have the full. Yeah. I don't have the all right, I'm from Birmingham, all right, how's it going? I don't have that. And I don't have the sort of Solly Hull accent because I'm from Solly Hull, really. And in Solly Hull, you know, people sort of speak like this. You know, it's, it's not a full on Birmingham accent, but it's close. Well, my, parent, my grandparents were from Cannon Chase, round about that area. Cannon Chase. Walsall. Oh, yeah. yeah. Walsall. So they have a pretty strong accent, but we it, we kind of lost it through the generations. Yeah. Okay. They were actually from Walsall. Yeah. My grandparents. I see. I see. That's black country, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Just sort of uh, to the west, northwest of Birmingham, near Wolverhampton. Mm. So they have a pretty strong accent there too. Yeah. So what happened to your accent? How come you I don't? don't know. Uh, never got one. My dad went to Oxford. <laughs> show off. Show Me off. too. <laughs> mine, mine, mine too. I mean, he went by bicycle. Did he really? Yes. What? Wait a minute. It was a from, long time ago. Hold on a minute. Your father <laughs> went to Oxford by bicycle from where? From Walsall, I guess. The, wait, wait, wait a minute. Every day. <laughs> no, not every day. No, no, no. But he went for like 13 weeks or whatever it was and then came back or something like that for the term. 
Really? That's quite a long mm. journey by I might bike. be making this up. This might not be factually completely 100% correct. But... It, does, it doesn't matter sometimes when we remember the past. We don't remember <laughs> it accurately. That's okay. It's not my past either. <laughs> yeah, it's your father's past. Yeah. So, okay. So your dad went to Oxford. So do you think that's part of it? So I think it? maybe he lost his accent. There. If he ever had an accent, I actually don't know. I've never asked him. Hmm. Okay. What was it like being a, if I can ask these questions, what was it like being the daughter of a, a vicar? Well, it did mean that we, have to, we had to go to church rather a lot. Yeah. And I remember when I was a kid, um, we'd go and cling to his robes because we'd want to be in the limelight with him. You know how people do that? Yeah. So that was a bit embarrassing for him. Uh, and also then my parents, well, my family, we moved to a little village called Warmington. Not Warmington on sea from Dad's army. <laughs> Warmington near Banbury in Oxfordshire. Okay. Yeah. And so my dad was then the vicar of four different parish, four different churches, Warmington, Shotswell, Radway and Ratley. Fantastic names. <laughs> Which is near Edge Hill. Okay. There was a famous battle. Yeah. Um, and so um, then he had to do four services. So we would sometimes have to go to like four harvest festivals. You know, we plough the field and scatter four times. I know all the hymns off by heart. What's a harvest festival? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, th- th- this, I'm the, giving you too much information. These conversations I? are tangent from a tangent from a tangent, <laughs> yeah. but that's we just we just sort of chase the chase the train, if that's an expression. Um, I don't know, uh, but anyway, uh, harvest festivals. Guess, yeah, harvest festivals a little bit like the American Thanksgiving thing, isn't it? Mm. Because um, we're celebrating. It comes at harvest time. Harvest is when you get in the fruit and the vegetables. Yeah. And so we take it to church to say thank you to God, don't we, for um, giving us this crop? Yeah, because I mean, I went to church as well uh, until I was about oh, till we moved. No, yeah, we until I, we moved to the Midlands because I, I grew up in West London actually until ah, okay. I was nine, mm-hmm. and then we moved to the Midlands. That was when a we, shock. <laughs> well, yeah, it was from the from the kind of urban suburban area to the middle of nowhere in Warwickshire. Mm. Um, so I, I used to go to church and we had harvest festivals too. Mm. And it mainly would involve us bringing fruits and vegetables, tinned food yeah. and stuff like that to the church. But I don't know what happened to the food afterwards. Well, I, I'm guessing it got redistributed for people that needed it. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you would hope they didn't just rot in the church. <laughs> Maybe that's what the strange smell is in churches. Maybe. <laughs> or is it the flowers? Yes, I don't know. <laughs> Frankincense. We didn't keep it, put it that way. We didn't get all those fruit and vegetables and tinned food. Okay. All right. So was it cool or not cool having a dad as a vicar or did it not make any difference? It didn't really make any difference. Uh, I didn't really particularly notice it. I mean, obviously, when I was a child, so this is a long time ago, we used to have the dial telephones. Yes. Do you remember them? I do. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that. I'm not that young, though. I'm 43. Ah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. You don't like that. You yeah. to, if you, you know, if you've got a number, you have to dial the thing. Yeah. Because we lived in a small village, we were very lucky because we only had three numbers. So, and ours was two one three. So it was right near the dial. You didn't have to do any nines. <laughs> because isn't that ridiculous? Have you ever thought that? But if you ring nine 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 in Britain, it used to be nine 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 for the emergency services. Yeah. And on a dial phone, that is the number that takes the longest to get round, isn't yeah, it? It is. It, it, it should be one one one. Yeah, you're right. But they can't. I mean. Well, we've gone beyond that problem now, <laughs> yeah. I suppose. As a kid, I remember those dial telephones. Nine was always the most fun number, though. Yeah, but remember when you messed up a number or you thought you got it wrong, you had to start again, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, it yeah. took hours. And there were other weird things about those old analogue phones, that if you tapped the... You know when you put the phone down, mm. it goes down on the what? Yeah. The, the, uh, it, it kind of goes down on a little button yeah uh, which but when, switches the whole thing off exactly isn't it? Yeah. but you could tap that little button mm-hmm. tap 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 over and over again and you could actually get through to someone oh did you get the operator yeah, like you, in the old phones you know yeah you would you'd get the <gasps> operator eventually she'd probably tell you off wouldn't she just saying stop tapping that phone there's like lots of different there were different operators as well Ooh. there was the 100 operator mm. and then there was the emergency services operator and then there was another one for uh, other things but oh those were the days directory inquiries directory inquiries yeah and there was the talking clock oh the talking clock yes <laughs> Do you remember what it used to say at the third stroke it will be 1300 hours precisely or something like that and then it? near the end it was sponsored by accurist oh goodness. the time sponsored by accurist <laughs> how do uh, you sponsor the time <laughs> <laughs> well they do what if they don't sponsor it anymore it stops 
Uh, the times, you know, the times kind of going, oh, you know, guys. Um. <laughs> we need a bit more money. Or they could blackmail. The time could blackmail that curist, couldn't they? The, um, <clears throat> if you don't pay up, we'll stop. Yeah, just everything's going to stop. It'd be yeah. like lockdown. There'll be no more time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I hope everyone can follow this conversation, ladies and gentlemen. What should we go back to? Coventry Cathedral. It's quite a significant cathedral in the UK, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's um, a mix of old destroyed cathedral from the the war mm. and then the very new cathedral, very modern, which didn't please some people. You know, it's a bit like the, the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Mm-hmm. It's way too modern. It looks like a toilet. <laughs> Coventry Cathedral is a bit more sophisticated than that. But. It's fantastic though, Coventry Cathedral. Mm. And the story being that it was one of the most magnificent cathedrals in the country. And it got, you know, during the Blitz, during the, during World War II, it got completely bombed to pieces like mm. the whole of Coventry did. Yeah, yeah. But now you, you live in France. How long have you yes. been here? So I've been living here for 28 years, yeah. which is rather a long time. Are you French? I'm not French. And I'm very frustrated about not being French because of Brexit. Mm-hmm. Because I thought I could survive by not being French. Uh, I've survived up till now. I didn't vote for the presidents. I trusted the French people to make the right decisions. Uh, but now, um, yes, I'm gonna. We're gonna end up having to get stuck in an administrative nightmare anyway. Mm. So I'm thinking maybe I might as well just go the full way now and become French. Yeah, I think I'm so. as good as French anyway. Yeah, your French is good, isn't it? Yeah, it's just I don't feel French inside. Will you ever? No. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. I, I guess the things... I mean, I lived in England until I was 26. Now you're going to be able to work out my age, people in the audience. Uh, and then I moved to Spain and then I moved to France. So I haven't lived in England for a very, very long time. But I still feel like I have very English things about me. Like I like to be on time, as you can see. Mm-hmm. I hate to be late. Uh, the first time I went for an interview in France, I think I was five or ten minutes later, I thought, this is it, they're never going to take me. And they, it was like nothing had happened. I couldn't believe yeah. it. You can be 15 minutes late here. Yeah. I also get extremely stressed where, at the lack of queue, of sensible queuing, although they're starting to bring in, with COVID, it has got a bit better. Mm-hmm. They're starting to bring in the Disneyland type of queues where you, you, you're snaked in and out. But I, I always hated trying to work out who was in front of me. And then... Once I pushed in, but without knowing it, and I felt so devastated because somebody said, no, it's my turn. I thought, oh, I'm so sorry. I felt so terrible that mm-hmm. I hadn't calculated this cue properly. Yeah. Of people just randomly standing around. Yeah, I get immensely frustrated oh, by queuing yeah. here. I've talked about this before, but we've got strict um, unconscious um, protocol in the UK about queuing, which is basically everyone sort of knows that you have to stand directly behind the person in front of you, not to the side a little bit. You're not turning left, turning right. (laughs) You're facing directly to their, you know, the centre of their... their, Lined up like a North Korean parade, military parade. Right. That the queue is intelligent in a way. Yeah. It has its own intelligence. It can bend round corners. It can it deal can, with which obstacles. Which French queues don't do, do they? They they don't care. They go across the road in front of places. Or if an obstacle arrives, the queue goes <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it splinters into all sorts yeah. of different things. And then factions. people then people decide they're going to have their queue there and the one direction and the queue goes off in another direction. And then they... There's a sort of clash when they start moving forward, you know. Mm-hmm. I get queue jumped all oh. the time. Yeah, here. yeah. Uh, it really frustrates me. The other day, though, I had a fantastic experience in car four, which doesn't happen to me very often. <laughs> Listeners, car four, that's not car, vroom, 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 number four. That's car four, meaning... Crossroads. Crossroads, means, crossroads. Yeah, in French. It's a French supermarket. I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, well, I suppose they used to have shops on the crossroads, I suppose, like general stores. But anyway, uh, car, I was in car four and I arrived at the queue more or less at the same time as a as a, a, a another man. And he kind of stepped in front of me and then he realized that I was technically the, the first one there. And he turned to me and he, and he went and he said in French, oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Oh. <gasps> And I was like, yes! Uh, maybe he was actually English. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> with, a, with a good French accent. Yeah, that is possible. Because yeah. he, he, he... I've never seen that happen before. No. He was like, oh, I'm terribly sorry. And he seemed genuinely kind of a yeah. bit devastated. Sorry. And I said, no, no, that's fine after you. <gasps> or you were looking extremely haggard. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite possible. Because if you were a woman, you'd probably take that badly. Because you'd think, do I look that bad? Do I look that old? Do I look pregnant? Do I look... What? 
So what if 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 uh, <laughs> hold on if someone apologizes to you for queue jumping in France it's only because you're an old or pregnant woman is that Yeah is or it? you look hand you know you, you, look look, you can't tired. walk on your own or something like that Yeah I see I see You sort of like madame you go first obviously because you're old decrepit yeah. Right I see I <laughs> I'm see. not that old for the people who are listening Yeah What do you do here Well I same as you I teach English Yeah as a foreign language. Yes. And I came over to do that. I didn't just improvise that when I got here like a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. I'm a real English teacher. Yeah. I like to say that on stage. Uh-huh. Because I also do stand-up comedy like you, Luke. Right, that's how we met. It is indeed. In mm. Um you work at university? I work in engineering schools. Mm-hmm. Um so it's people who um have l- have got their baccalaureate in French, A levels in English. I don't know what it is in American. It's, isn't it they're like uh, uh, so they're, SAT, SATs, something like that? Ooh, I don't know. Don't they do that when they're 11? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I could do Anyway, it, whatever but, it is. Yeah. The higher, no, that's Scotland. Um, so people over 18, basically very young adults. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like university age. And they're engineers. And I work in a school which is interesting. It's called EPF. And it's, it used to be, the F used to be feminine. And it used to be an engineering school for women or for young girls. They needed, Young women. They needed a whole separate school? Because um, it was a very male-dominated career. So it was the idea of bringing up the equality. And at some stage, I don't know exactly when, they let in the men and then that was it. And now they, they boast to have a high intake of women, but there's still many, many more boys there than, than girls. Okay. Yeah. So what kind of English lessons are you providing there? Well, I mostly um, prepare people for the TOEIC exam. You probably know that one. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, so we do a lot of TOEIC. To be an engineer, they have to have a certain high, a certain score at the TOEIC, and it's always going up because the and different engineering schools are competing with each other. Mm. So basically, we have to prepare them for that. Uh, and otherwise, we're doing general business English to prepare them for working life. Mm-hmm. What have you found to be successful or effective in your lessons when you're doing this? Um... That's an interesting question. <laughs> Difficult to answer. Um, what am I trying to get at here? What do you mean exactly? What I mean is, though, is, so tell me about teaching business English to young engineers then. Do they, do, do they, do they respond to, your, to the topics and stuff well? I mean, yes. I mean, engineers generally tend to be in the majority, and obviously I'm generalizing here, more introverted than extroverted. In France, people concentrate a lot on maths and science subjects and they tend to neglect languages. Uh, France tends to neglect languages generally or people somehow don't manage to acquire a very high level of language sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not always. Thank you, Netflix. Are we allowed to say Netflix? Yeah, sure. (laughs) Of course you can, yeah. Why not? So so people's levels are getting better because now they have more content in English that they watch on their own. Yeah. But so... Young engineers tend to be a little bit introverted, so we're often working on um, uh, the soft skills, you know, the how to give a good presentation, body language, things like this, confidence. Yeah. This is what they find the hardest. They're good at, um, you know, learning vocabulary, doing exercises, writing things down. Mm-hmm. But it's more the presenting, Yeah. you know, that type of thing. In my experience, the French students are good on paper. They, oh, the, absolutely. The, the yeah. written word, mm. reading and writing. But when it comes to, as you said, the, those soft skills or the, the more oral side of things, that's yeah. when things get tricky. Yeah. Why, why have they got that confidence issue, do you think? Uh, I think it's the French school system where um, you're marked out of 20. And basically, if you get 10, you're fine. But if you get under 10, you're classed as being useless. Uh, to your face. <laughs> what, really? <laughs> yeah, almost. Uh, or you have this feeling that you're a failure. Yeah. Uh, and obviously there's a different um, no, uh, mark for every subject. So you might be useless at one subject and good at another one. But if you happen to be useless at everything, it's quite demoralizing, I think. Yeah. So it, it tends to make them not want to answer if they're not going to be right. There's this kind of competition type thing that I, I will just keep quiet and stick with my 10 than, than humiliating myself mm. in public. <laughs> Which is totally at odds with how we should learn a language. A language, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm. Shouldn't be under that kind of pressure. Yeah, yeah. But then again, in France, they learn philosophy for one year. 
philosophy in one year in order to cram it for an exam. For what purpose? Yeah, exactly. Because I'm sure that it doesn't really stick when you learn it for one year. No. What kind of philosophy are they learning then? Do I you don't know? really know. I think they're learning, you know, all the basics of each individual. You know, the book Sophie's... Um, Sophie's World. Sophie's World, yeah. yeah. That's how I learned philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't do it at school. It's basically different schools of thought. Yeah. To... And then to answer one question. In the exam, there is one question, some deeply philosophical question. I don't know what it is. So they have to bring in all the the different, I don't know, the different authors. Yeah, different I see. Schools of thought. I have no idea. Okay, so it's, that's, that's quite um, abstract, isn't it, really? Mm. Rather than uh, pragmatic um, and vocational. It's not yeah. the sort of thing that gives you specific skills that you can not then apply. Not at all, no. But also you would think philosophy, you, you could kind of do it from the start, couldn't you? And integrate it into everyday you know, when you're in the primary school talking about philosophy, you know, at that level and just bring it up to when you get to that age. But if you don't have an exam at the end of it, nobody's interested. Yeah, I see. They want to get their 10 at okay. least. Okay. Talking about language learning. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're flying around all over the place here, but I mean, that's just normal conversation, isn't it? Y your French after however many years is, is, is really strong now. Um, can you tell me about the process that you've gone through? Yeah, so I learned French up to A-level stage. So I had a very good, because I was quite a swatty student, you know, so I would do the work. And so I, I'd learned lists and lists of vocabulary and things like that. I remember when I first came to France, I knew all the parts of the car. So, good. Yeah, in French. But, of course, I didn't know any of the slang. And I didn't know the very specifics. Uh, I learned recently that headlights was not the word I thought it was. So in uh, do you want a yeah, French go lesson go here? Go yes, please. So I'd learnt um, les phares was the front of the car. That's your headlights. Mm. And so when you dim your, your headlights, for me, that was like when you dim your lights in your flat, you know, yeah. you turn a button and the, the lights go down. Mm -hmm. No, you have different bulbs in there and they call them the feu de croisement, the crossing, when you cross another car. Okay. And so my feu de croisement weren't working at all. Hold on a minute. <laughs> what do you mean? So I was basically driving around with no headlights. If I'd have put them on full beam, they would have worked. Wait a minute. How does the fact, <laughs> wait, how, how does the fact that you didn't know the correct word uh, mean that you, you no, weren't? No, because everybody was telling me, oh, it's your feu de croisement. And I thought, well, that doesn't matter. That must be a little light somewhere. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you had a problem with your car. The lights, uh, the, the, the dimmed lights weren't working. Because, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the, headlights, on, the yeah. headlights. On cars, there are like two settings for the headlights. You've got full beam and you've got dipped or dimmed, actually dipped. Dipped is yeah, what we say, dip, isn't it? Yeah. You dip mm. your headlights, uh, full beam or dipped. And so you were driving around in, in, in your car and the dipped uh, uh, version, version wasn't working at all. Wasn't working. And people were saying, you know, your... Um, feu de croisement are croisement not working. Are not working. You were like, what? Never mind. I just thought there was those little lights that you put on, you know, when it's a bit foggy or something. Yeah. Side lights, you were thinking. Because I was thinking that, you know, those were the... It was the same light. It was the same bulb. You just put it on stronger or weaker like you do in your apartment when yeah. you want to be a bit sexy. You dim the lights. <laughs> so, you know, I have no knowledge of cars, but then I don't want to have any knowledge of cars. You know, that's not my job. Yeah, but if you're I, driving. <laughs> yeah, but they explained to me then in every detail, the, the, the mechanic of what, you know, you had to do to my car. It was very expensive. Um, but I was thinking, well, that's your job. I really don't want to know. Just, just do it for me and I will pay at the end. <laughs> Right, right. I don't want to get involved in car mechanics. So essentially what you're saying is you, you sort of have learnt by trial and error. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, so I, I would say that my French is pretty good, but I'd still make the le and the la mistakes, the mm -hmm. masculine and the feminine. Um, now and again, I might forget a word, but in English, I might forget a word as well, you know. And I'm not the dictionary that I used to be. As an English teacher, people are often asking me, how do you say this in, in English? And Generally, I, I can never find the word when somebody says that to me. I, I know it, probably. I hope. Yeah. But I can't find it on, you know, I just can't find it anymore. It's like that joke of Sebastian Marx. 
um, I don't know if you know the one, but it's always, I always remember this <laughs> because it, it, it was like a bit of a slap in the face for me uh, when I first came here. Hmm. And uh, he has this joke, which is where he's talking about how learning French means that uh, uh, so, uh, he had to come to a point where he had to kind of let go of some of his English vocab ah. in order to learn French properly. Really? And that, that, that was really some reason oh, I, that oh. was dreadfully frightening for me. And the joke is, you know, that... Um, he couldn't remember the word grapefruit or he was holding on to the word grapefruit because in all the other languages like pomplamus or something yeah. similar <laughs> and his brain had basically said to him, you know, Sebastian, just let grapefruit go. <laughs> Let grapefruit go. Heard that joke. Yeah, it's, it's a really good joke, but yeah. I, it really meant a lot to me because for me, I think I've been really sort of holding on to all my English vocab because it is my bread and butter. Yeah, well, I don't really agree with doing that. I think you can hold on to both. We have enough space in our brain. Apparently, we don't use our whole brain, do we? So, no, I don't think, I, I think it's, sometimes it's harder to find that word, but I don't think we've let go of it completely. Mm. And I don't think we should, especially as English teachers. It's very dangerous. When you start saying, I've got a button on my face, you're in trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> it, it, that is because, ladies and gents, in French, un bouton is... Is it un or une Ooh, bouton? Un bouton. Un yeah. bouton is I'd a... I say instinctively. It's a spot, uh, uh, acne or a spot on your face. In French, it's a button. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those false friends. Yes. Yes, that's right. Do you Have you found that um, your French has improved... Let's see. Did you ever have a kind of a breakthrough moment with French? Did you ever have a, a moment where you felt like, oh, I'm now sort of a lot more confident with this? I can't really remember. It would probably be when I understood a price. <laughs> you know, those numbers are very weird, aren't they, in French? Which, which ones? Which you numbers? know, like 99. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm joking. I, I honestly know. I mean, I did have a... I was quite happy with my level of French when I arrived because I did have quite an academic French mm. because I'd come from Spain and in Spain I didn't speak Spanish before I arrived. So my Spanish was just like all bits and bobs that I picked up here and there. Basically, I learned how to order beers in bars, mm -hmm. which is even more complicated than in France because there's even less of a queue. Oh, really? Oh, gosh. You'd hate, you'd Go hate Spain. Tell me more. Oh, really? <laughs> Nice weather. It's basically, right? the person that shouts the loudest gets served. Really, it's you know, very, yeah. shout, very shouty. Yeah. Nice very weather, nice people, nice food. Lovely, yeah. A bit yeah. smilier. It's funny yeah. because when I came to France, everybody said, oh, people are like this because they're Latin. I said, no, that's not Latin. You're miserable. The, la <laughs> the Spanish people, you know, they're, they're loud, and but they're smiley and so on. That's Latin. Again, I have to refer to Sebastian Marx again because he is, he, he's covered most of the things that we, you know, all of us all talk about. Um, his thing is that, uh, according to him, the French are Latin people living in northern weather. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Or certainly the Parisians are, anyway. Yeah, yeah. because people would say to me, oh, uh, England in the England, the weather's terrible, isn't it? And I'm like, I've just come from Spain, you know. <laughs> so they're because they're if you complain about the French, you know, the weather in Paris, you know, right? But they're always comparing the weather. Wait a minute, you mean, you mean if you compare about the weather in Paris, they're kind of like you have no right to complain, exactly, because yeah. your weather is you worse. Come from England, your weather is terrible all the time; it rains nonstop. Yeah, but uh, I just come from Spain, and in Spain it was sunny most of the year, even if it wasn't hot, it was sunny. It was sunny most of the year, even yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It could be very cold, but sunny. So it seems like your French, you, you, you've, you've had quite a, a comfortable relationship with French then, yeah, more or less. Yeah, not too bad. I mean, um, I, just not long after arriving in France, I had children. So then I learned all the words for all the, the different gadgets. And I found that with my American friends, we would use the French words because our vocabulary was so different between American English and British English. Uh -huh. You know, they say diaper, we say nappy. They say pacifier, we say dummy. Mm. They say, we say pushchair, they say stroller. Mm -hmm. We don't have one word in common about children things. So we would tend to just use uh, the French word because then we'd understand each other, you know. <laughs> right, I see. Do you feel different uh, when you speak French? Do you feel like a different person? Uh, sometimes I actually forget that I am English. I don't mean that in a pretentious way, but I forget that I have that thing. You know, when I'm with my French friends and we're chatting, blah, 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 blah. I, I sometimes forget that, yeah, I have that thing. I'm a foreigner. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm, I'm one of everybody else. Yeah. I think I've fitted in here, yeah, you know. And wait. Was that the question? Though? No, it wasn't no, that the no, question. No, well, kind of. But I mean, I mean, um, do, uh, 
do you feel like a different person when you oh, yeah. when in when French inhabits you? Uh, do you feel like you have a different personality? Does your mood change? Does your body language change? It does when I do stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. Definitely, uh, I do. I started in French because I was scared of the English scene. Why? <laughs> because uh, no, actually, I felt like I had nothing to say. I, I felt like the English scene did a lot of French bashing. Uh, and I thought, oh, you know, I wasn't in that mood, you know. So I wanted to talk about things that were going on in France, much more uh, specific things. And I felt they couldn't do that in English. Okay. So um, I started doing stand up in French. And in French, I came over, I think my accent was much stronger on stage. And I came over as being a bit naive. I could play off that image being, oh, I'm English. Oh, oh, things are like this. Oh, oh, I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, that naiveness. Whereas in English, I can just be much more hardcore with people. (laughs) In English, you can. I can be if I want. Yeah. When we do things like roasts, you know. Right. It can be mean to people. But that is that is that because of the culture of the, the of stand-up in French and English? Because in English we have roasts and in, in French... By the way, listeners, a roast is when one per, it's Let's say it's someone's birthday and uh, all the other comedians basically make jokes about that person. Mm, they mean jokes. Really mean, really mm, seriously nasty. mean, nasty jokes mm. uh, about that person. But it's all in the spirit of... It's a sort of... It's an American thing, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is, roast. actually. Yes, I'd never heard of it, it's, I must admit. It's an American okay. tradition. And it's, a roast in English would be eating... Sunday roast. Sunday roast. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, where were we? Yeah. I was asking you. So, my diff- I have a different personality in the two languages, probably a little bit, but a lot less now as my French has kind of caught up. Yeah. I guess. Okay. So you've sort of merged into I must, one. Yeah. Person. I must admit, though, I don't feel like a Parisian or the cliche of a Parisian because I live in the suburbs. And I think life is a lot more is a lot more normal in the suburbs. I don't know if that's the way to put it. You know, we don't have extreme wealth and extreme poverty. We don't have area. You know, we people just get on with it in the suburbs. I think. Whereas in Paris. Whereas in Paris, um, you have um, that cliched view of Paris, mm-hmm. uh, where everybody's super chic and slim for women anyway, and the men are chic and, and people are smoking and all this. Those cliches. Those cliches. Yeah. Uh, we see in TV series. Like the new Netflix TV show, Emily in Paris, which uh, we've been talking about. Yes. Uh, we were talking about it before. Anyway. Yes. So those are the, that's the beautiful side of Paris, isn't it? And the, the beautiful monuments. Um, we don't even see a bus, I don't think, in Emily in Paris. No. No, it's just a perfect world. Mm-hmm. And then there's, um, yeah, I mean, and under the business district and all of that, that is the image of Paris, isn't it? And also the people being a bit rude and a bit in a hurry and parking badly and honking and, you know, the, the agitated side of Paris. Yeah. In the suburbs, it's a lot quieter, you know, it's a lot calmer. Yeah. Which was nice during the lockdown. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was, it was actually really nice in Paris during the lockdown too, because mm. it was just so quiet. Yeah. Except all the joggers going. <laughs> yeah, lots of joggers. Everyone became a jogger. And everybody bought a dog as well, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, everyone was just any excuse to go walking around outside. Yeah. But it was sort of quite serene. Yeah, it was eerie, wasn't it? It was, exactly. That's a nice word, isn't it? It's great. Eerie. I love it when I rediscover words. The other word I rediscovered, and it was because of Emily in Paris, um, they called, they said something was rangar. And rangar means old fashioned. Well, they translated it as. Um, basic it's basic which is maybe the american way of saying it well basic is the is the sort of uh, current word Hmm. meaning sort of unsophisticated yeah basically exactly like oh my god she's so basic yeah but it's very american isn't it and Mm -hmm. i was thinking i wouldn't say that for hangar so i looked it up and i found the word you're gonna love this luke Mm. fuddy duddy oh yes fuddy duddy fuddy duddy two words it is two words hyphenated I'm not sure if it's hyphenated. Really, just it? two words: F U D D Y space D U D D Y. So, tell us about fuddy duddy then. So, fuddy duddy, it, it's that. It is almost what it, it's almost onomatopoeic, isn't it? Mm. And you can imagine books being blowing the dust off them because they're full of fuddy duddy. It's old fashioned. Yeah. You call well, somebody a fuddy duddy. Like I could call you a fuddy duddy because you're wearing um, those type of slippers. I am wearing. Which we call them charentaires in French. I in uh, ladies and gentlemen, checkered slippers. Uh, we are at home in my <laughs> in my pod uh, pod castle. 
um, <laughs> Pod HQ. And today I am wearing slippers because, yeah. um, you know, because this is how I roll. Uh, and yes, they are slippers that look quite old fashioned style, like granddad slippers. Yeah, you could you could say they're fuddy duddy yeah. then. Yeah. Whereas I'm wearing extremely cool trainers. You are. These are Nike kind of uh, Air Max type things. I didn't know. I bought them by accident. They're black because I went to the shop and I said, uh, I went to a trainer shop, a uh, sneakers shop, if you like, for the Americans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said, I want some trainers, you know, nothing flashy, not flashy colors, not high heels. I'm not going to go running ever in them. I just want something comfortable. So he said, oh, yeah, you can have these. And I think the guy must have been laughing <laughs> as he gave me them because apparently there's a super cool, they were super cool in the underworld, you know. Underground. Yeah, like, but about 10 or 20 years ago. So people say, oh, I used to have a pair like that. But yeah. pe- everybody notices my trainers and it's embarrassing. They're cool trainers. They are cool, but they're too cool for me. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You're too French now. <laughs> it seems too, too hung up on, you, on the way you look. <laughs> Stand up once said to me, he saw my trainers and then he looked up and he went, Oh, it's you. <laughs> I was the wrong person wearing them. They're too cool for me. Well, that's too stylish. That's your style, Elspeth. You've got to own it. Yeah. I think yeah. that's cool. So cool at the bottom, not cool at the top. <laughs> I think it's good. I think it's great to have that kind of uh, juxtaposition. Yeah, but I, they do get noticed a lot and I do get embarrassed. People, like very hip people say to me, oh, I like your trainers. And I'm like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to buy them. <laughs> oh, you're so I didn't English. do it on purpose. You suddenly became so English. Absolutely. You were so French a second ago and now you're so English again. Yeah, apologising. Apologising. Why? Because they noticed your trainers? No, because they're too cool for me. There's no, there, are no, there are no rules. I know, but you know, it's like, do you remember when Tony Blair started wearing jeans? <laughs> <laughs> it's like that it's yeah. suddenly jeans are not cool anymore are they right yeah Tina just stopped wearing jeans when Tony Blair started wearing them yeah I guess I guess um, mm, so we're mm. into fashion now we're in the city of fashion so you know <laughs> yeah um, have you I was going to say has your fashion sense changed since you came here I have zero fashion sense as you can see <laughs> you're wearing cool trainers you're, you're, yeah but that was an accident <laughs> slim jeans it's it's a it, you know you're wearing a woolen sweater but yeah don't put yourself down no but uh i'm really not into fashion i don't understand fashion i really am a bit of a country bumpkin expression ah. country bumpkin is uh somebody who grew up in the country who's not very sophisticated <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. me yeah oh, really. so uh it's never really particularly interested me fashion and i've never understood it so yeah. i don't even try anymore yeah that's something with age that you get I've got past that. Well, I'm I'm living that at this very moment, but I'm in I'm in my comfort zone at this point. Absolutely, I'm yeah. wearing a fleece that I bought from Uniqlo, <laughs> which I'm going to call my podcast f- fleece, my recording you need fleece. A fleece. Yeah, for winter, it's quite perfect. It's perfect for podcasting as well because it sort of like damp and deadens the the sound slightly. It, it's like a sort of um, soundproofing almost um, to stop your heart beating too loud, <laughs> <laughs> or the sound rebounding off. You know, if I wear if I wear a shirt that's too fashionable. The sound will bounce off it. Oh yeah! <laughs> so a fleece is kind of muffles the sound nicely, and and that's that's good. And I'm wearing these fuddy duddy old uh, old man slippers. But you are wearing jeans. If I was at home, I'd be wearing tracksuit bottoms. Oh, I love wearing or tracks. leggings or something, you know, or even pajama trousers. Let's face it, viewers. <laughs> it's nice to slip into a pair of tracky bees. Oh yeah, when you get home. You see, that was the joy of lockdown because I taught online during lockdown. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, which was pretty hardcore, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. How many hours were you doing that for? Well, it it was the same. I would do the same amount of time, but uh, very quickly we evolved into me giving them work to do, giving them a time limit, and then telling them to come back after. Oh, yeah, because right. I found it exhausting uh, being face to face online with you know uh, ten or fifteen people. Yeah, I don't think it was very beneficial for anybody. You know, yeah, it is extremely tiring. Mm. Mm-hmm. And also, they didn't necessarily have very good connection either. So you know, they might have been on their phones, and I had people who the little brother was doing his um, his exam next door. You know, so they had to be really careful about different people's situations. Difficult times. Mm. Difficult times. Let's hope we're not going there again. <laughs> Well, you know, who knows? But uh, talk to me about doing stand-up then. Um, hmm. what's, what's the best thing about doing stand-up? Well, certainly at the moment, it's have be able to just laugh about anything. <laughs> it's getting, you know, a lot of the things I talk about on stage at the moment are linked to um, the COVID situation, lockdown, the strangeness of things, the strangeness of wearing masks, 
you know, and thinking back and comparing, you know, it's given us a whole new lot of material, I think. Mm. I like the people as well. I like the other stand upers. I like the fact that we're all kind of equal on, you know, either you perform well, so you. Oh, I can't remember the word. <laughs> you you kill it. Yeah, you kill. That's what yeah. we say on stage. Yeah, yeah. Or you bomb. Yeah. Or somewhere in between. <laughs> right. But uh, everybody is equal and you have good days and bad days and, and we know each other. And and I like the mix of ages as well. I, I know people of all from all walks of life because of stand-up. Uh-huh. What, about the, what about the worst part of it? The worst part of it is bombing, obviously. <laughs> Tell me about that. So uh, bombing is when you, you think you have a really funny set and you think you have a really funny observation about life. But you don't quite manage to get that across to the audience. And so they don't laugh where you're expecting them to laugh. Mm-hmm. And so obviously when you start out, it's devastating. You go home and cry into your pillow and say, I'll never do it again. But you do. Uh, with a bit more experience, you get used to, maybe you have also some kind of backup lines, which will maybe... You know, you say that one worked really well last night or, you know, something that will maybe get a little reaction from the audience mm-hmm. so you don't feel quite so bad. Mm-hmm. Um, well, what's the worst you ever bombed? Ooh. Have you got, have, have you got a sp- I don't think specific I have a th- story at all? Specific, I think, I mean, I've done some gigs in some very challenging places. Yeah. Um, we did a gig once in a restaurant where it was girls' night. It was It was advertised as girls' night. So... All the people that were going to be on stage were female. Um, and But it was basically girls' night where the girls didn't or paid reduced rates for drinks. And so girls, big groups of girls, had gone out to have a good night out mm-hmm. with other girls. Yeah. And they didn't want to sit, stand around or sit around and listen to people telling jokes. They just wanted to have fun. So we had nobody listening to us, basically. You know, we were trying to sort of shout our way, even with a microphone. You know, sometimes you, people don't expect you or they're not, not interested in you. Yeah, that is pretty horrible, isn't it? When mm. you're trying to perform and there is blah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're trying to talk to them. Horrible. When you're in a comedy club, it's better because the people have come to see comedy, but it's not always the case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's enough. Or, or of course, those other gigs where there's just been three people in the audience as well. And when you perform in English, you're not sure that it's just that they don't understand you, you know? Yeah. Probably you're hilarious, but they don't understand. <laughs> you have to hope that you tell yourself that. Right? Um, how do you do? How do you come up with your material? That's that's like a, a question that um, non-comedy people ask comedians. How do you come up with your material? But I mean, talk to me about the process of. So, do you do you actually tell jokes on stage? I don't know. Do I? <laughs> I often tell. Yeah, I think I do. Mm-hmm. Um. So, for example, I'll, I'll think about a situation. I don't know. Things just come to... Actually, I get inspired in my shower. Yeah. Or in my bathroom in general. Really? Is it, what's that? The proximity to water or the... I wonder, naked, yeah. The, no, naked, because the nudity or... I think it's the fact that you're kind of switched off. You know, they say they talk about flow, you know, flow activities. Do you know? Have you heard about that? I've kind of heard of it, but, I, but please explain. So these are activities where you're not really thinking, you know, you're not engaging your brain. They're things that you do automatically, like washing up or driving or something like that. Mm. And it's at these times where your brain is a little bit vacant, uh, where uh, things come to you, you know. Actually, that isn't necessarily a flow activity, a flow, <laughs> but that's when you, you can be inspired. A flow activity is when you're so engaged in an activity that you don't see the time go past. Right. Actually, I, see. I got it the wrong way around. You're in a flow state yeah. as well. That's, yeah, I've exactly. Heard of that too. Yeah. So in the shower, that's kind of like... Um, that's just brain being turned off a bit, you know. Yeah. You switch but, off your brain and these ideas sort of tumble in yeah. somehow. Well, for example, I have a new joke about... Um, world exclusive about um there is a shazam for bird song wait a minute shazam shazam is an application where if you hear a piece of music that you like you click on the application and it will tell you in seconds uh who the artist is and the title of the song yeah which is great it outsources our memories for us (laughs) see you don't need a memory we've got google translate we've got (laughs) you don't need to remember grapefruit anymore that's right (laughs) so Shazam, everybody, use, well, a lot of people use that application. And I was in the shower and I was listening to a radio channel and a guy comes on to talk about this. So, 
out of nowhere, there is a Shazam for bird song. So apparently people know this. So if you, sorry, if you hear a bird singing, yeah, you exactly. can Shazam it. Yeah, so you could, during lockdown, you could put your phone out the window and you'd find out which bird it was. But more intense, birds in different parts of the country have different accents. What? So birds in the north have different accents to birds in the south, for example. This is fantastic. Or my French is not good. <laughs> or I was listening late at night. No, this no, is what I, I understood. I have heard... I've heard something similar before, yeah. Yeah, and that French-speaking birds, entre guillemets, uh, migrate to French-speaking countries. English-speaking birds migrate to English-speaking countries. So I found that fascinating as a piece of information, don't you? Yes, absolutely. And most people do. And I feel like I'm giving a TED Talk when I do this on stage. <laughs> so I was thinking, I, I need a punchline. <laughs> so I found one. You don't need to think about it, Luke. You would have found me a brilliant one, probably. But... So I came up with, I said, so this, so birds learn from humans. So this explains Parisian pigeons. This is why Parisian pigeons are such assholes. <laughs> they, it's a good joke. <laughs> they shit on your head at any opportunity. When you're walking down the street, they're in front of you, you know, on the pavement. They don't move. They look at you with those dead eyes. You have to walk on the road mm -hmm. and they don't migrate. Parisian pigeons. No, they just go down to their country houses <laughs> And then they sit on terraces and bitch about all the other pigeons. You know, oh, look at him. What's he wearing? Yeah. With their French accents. Uh, right, so that was okay. my joke yeah. about birds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which came from... <laughs> Sound of a huge audience applauding. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody. Which came from me hearing this on the radio. Random piece of information. I do like random pieces of information. Yeah. I kind of would like to be a sort of TED Talk slash comedian. You know, that's my ideal... Like mm. educating, but at the same time, making people laugh. Is there a crossover between teaching and stand-up comedy? Absolutely, because that's probably one of the reasons I started stand-up was that I liked making my students laugh in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, that well, maybe I didn't say this, but uh, my parents now actually live in Stratford-upon-Avon. Oh, Stratford-upon-Avon. I think yeah, so everybody it, knows Stratford-upon-Avon. Again, that's sort of my neck of the woods. Yeah, but also um, I... My parents live there. I've never lived there. But for convenience sake, I say that I come from there when yeah. people ask me where I come from. Because if I say a little village in the middle of... Forget it. Yeah. So, um, so obviously, uh, Stratford-upon-Avon is famous for... Shakespeare. Shakespeare. So then we do a little talk about Shakespeare. And, um, and I say Stratford-upon-Avon is also famous for another foursome, another British foursome. And they're all going, what, the Beatles? They're going, what, the Beatles? But they know deep down it's not the Beatles because they know deep down that the Beatles are from Liverpool. Mm -hmm. so he says, shaking. <laughs> um, so then they say, you know, Oasis, and they might know the odd group. You know, Spice Girls know that's five, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're desperately trying to find it. And do you know what the answer is, Luke? No. It's the Teletubbies. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, they come from Stratford-upon-Avon. Do they really? <laughs> they do, yes. Oh, my. Did they all go to, like, the Royal Shakespeare Company to learn how to be I Teletubbies? I not talk. <laughs> Method acting, yeah, or something. absolutely. Yeah. I don't know who they actually are. Maybe they are all Royal Shakespeare Company members. You what? They're not. What? They're, <laughs> they're not mean, aliens from outer space. They're not just Teletubbies. No, no. Really? No. So anyway, they were hatched or they were born in Stratford upon Avon. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's filmed around there, but I think it might have been. But we used to have a Teletubbies shop, and this was very convenient because this was the year my kids were born and they were young. Teletubbies were born at the same time. Is there a connection? And um, so we used to go to the Teletubbies shop and we could play with all the Teletubbies. They had a thing, you know, with the, the hill. A Just, very... I wonder if all the listeners, because, you know, they might not know the Teletubbies. <gasps> you go, you give, don't know what on, you're missing. Give, give us a, 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 very quick, a very quick summary of what they, the Teletubbies is. So Teletubbies... Or are. I mean, it is because it's the name of a TV show. So yeah. what is the TV show? So it's a TV show made for very small children. Um, and these are sort of very fat... There's four colours, uh, red, yellow, purple and green. green. And they've got sort of normal size heads, but very fat bellies with a television in them. I don't know and why. They've all got objects that stick and out the top of their heads. they have different shapes on the top of their heads, don't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah. And they're called Tinky Winky, Dipsy, Lala and Poe. Poe has a scooter, but she can't pronounce. So they can't talk properly. And Poe's scooter says Poe Kuta. And so it was very, there was a controversy when they came out that our children wouldn't learn to talk properly because they go, oh, uh -oh, uh oh, and they talk like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a scandal, you know, our children are going to all talk like that. It's flipping weird, the Teletubbies. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I think students watch it late at night uh, under the influence. Really? 
Oh, absolutely, yeah. And there's also, have you ever seen the black and white creepy version of Teddy? That's scary. <laughs> no. That is scary. Well, it's like someone's done a version of yeah, it. Yeah, like on, a sort of... Mm, on YouTube? Version. Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay, like a horror version. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because basically, what do they do? They run around all day and there's a rabbit, which is a real rabbit. You yeah. never watched anything? I think it's... I mean, my my take on it is that it's a post-apocalyptic uh, <laughs> uh, future. And Maybe. that the Teletubbies, yeah, they live in a post-apocalyptic authoritarian world. With that big sun looking down on this, them. This weird With a baby sun. face in it. And though. every now and, and and then these speakers come out of the ground and go, mm. time for tubby bye-bye. And they, <laughs> and they all have to go underground. Yeah. So, yeah, they're obviously living in a post-nuclear, uh, post-apocalyptic authoritarian uh, future. In Stratford-upon-Avon. In Stratford-upon-Avon. <laughs> because Stratford-upon-Avon so is in Warwickshire. That's the name of the county. And the use, there is a sign that says Stratford upon Stratford upon it. Oh. No, it's Warwickshire. Warwickshire Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's County. County. There we go. And for for April Fool's Day, so on April Fool's Day in in Britain, we play practical jokes on each other. First of April. Yeah, we call it April Fool's Day. Yeah, so it's the first of April, but you're only allowed to play jokes until twelve o'clock, because midday. After that, you are the fool. So that's the tradition, or it was when I lived there. It's probably changed since. <laughs> if you make a, if you do a practical joke on someone after midday, yeah, you're, you're the, the fool. fool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you can do stupid things like, I mean, when I was a kid, we used to do stuff like I used to play practical jokes on my brother. I would uh, lean, the, uh, open the door slightly, put a cushion on top of the door, Perfect. and I'd go, James, and he'd come <laughs> in, and then the pillow would fall on his head. Hilarious. Well, you're quite a nice brother because people put buckets of water and things like that. You can. You could do buckets yeah. of water, st- other so stuff. That's a perfect example of a practical joke. The other one was putting cling film on the toilet, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, or the or the um, was it an apple pie bed, pork pie bed? What's, what's <laughs> yeah, the, what's the apple pie? Isn't apple it? pie bed, which is basically where so in a bed you've got the the fitted sheet which goes over the mattress, and then you've got the pillows, and then you've got a a, a sheet. And then the duvet on top of that. And with the apple pie bed, you take the sheet and you tuck where normally the bottom where the, would go over your feet. You take that part and you tuck it up under the pillows so it looks like the fitted sheet. Someone opens the bed. They try and get in. They can't get in because oh. the sheet is folded round no, I, underneath I never them. knew what that was, but yes. Um, is it an apple pie bed? Mm, I don't want to get it wrong. Mm. Um, it's, not, it's not a pork pie bed, is it? <clears throat> We have a lot of pies in England. Let's think of all the pies we have in England while you look this up. Steak and kidney pie bed. Shepherd's pie bed. Uh, apple pie bed. It is an apple pie bed. A yeah. short sheeted bed in which the sheet is folded back on itself halfway down as a practical joke so that the victim <laughs> cannot get into it. Has your brother, did James do that to you then? I think we've all done it to each other at some point or another. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I've ever done that one. But anyway. Anyway, so. so. So they changed for an April Fool's joke. They changed the sign to Warwickshire. Teletubbies County. Uh, ha, ha, ha. You can imagine how p- offended people were by that. There was an up cry, you know. Outrage. Outrage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. English people were almost cross. <laughs> yeah, English people didn't smile at each other in the streets a- anymore. <laughs> aggressively drinking tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <sighs> they were nearly at the trolley rage stage, weren't they? <laughs> uh, That's why we do the, all those rages, isn't it? Do you know that? What because rage? we're so um, suppressed. Well, sorry, su- what rages? So we have, uh, in England, we have road rage, don't we? Mm-hmm. But we also have variants of that. And one of them is trolley rage, where you go pushing your trolley aggressively around the supermarket. Yeah. Right. And I think that's because we suppress our emotions so much that eventually we just boil over. You know, we explode. Yeah. But, I mean, they don't have trolley rage in France or in Paris no, so much. because... As, they're, they're, but that's just, I mean... That's I, life. They just stroll around they don't they don't have empathy <laughs> controversial opinions here i thought you didn't like french bashing <laughs> yeah but i don't say that on stage obviously oh okay no uh, ah, okay. <laughs> i'm trying um, to get nationality no no but i think I, you know uh, when people talk about french bashing that means criticizing usually parisians yeah uh, it's, it's to be fair to the whole country um criticizing the parisians for their for their ways um mm-hmm. And, but, uh, also, but, but I find that Parisians will do it too. They're, they're, but they it, absolutely w- love it as well. Yeah. They love it when people do that to them. When, when people criticise them, they're kind of like, yeah, we're right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're real bastards, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> they love it. Yeah, they yeah. do. Uh, and, and whenever I, I mean, I don't know. If, uh, I, yes, uh, I, I do find that Parisian people will also complain about Paris as well. It's just it's weird. Absolutely. I don't, yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why. 
it's like I think that. it's just a very, very uh, dense city. So it's in a city of, you know, when things are dense, things take bigger proportions. Perhaps, Everyone's you know? living on top of each other Absolutely. all the time. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, yeah. look at the, the buildings, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're the, building, literally out of the buildings loom over you yeah. all the time. It makes you feel quite small, doesn't but it? But also people live above shops, above the, you know, in, in London, it's not the same density, is it? London's a lot more spread out. Yeah. Whereas Paris is like built up on top of itself. Mm. London's kind of spread out to the edges a bit more. So we have a bit more space. Mm. But in Paris, everyone's kind of like mm, on top of each other. But, you know, I lived in Japan. I lived uh, just, you know, oh, yeah, so spent lots of time in Tokyo and people are massively crammed in together. And they're not like that there. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. People are extremely respectful. They keep their distance from each other. They are they they are very thoughtful. They make sure they don't take up too much room mm. when you get on the train. You know, everyone is very, very well uh, trained uh, or, or everyone has the right mentality where they make sure they're not taking up too much space so you were probably the rude one in japan weren't you oh yeah being a brit yeah <laughs> so as a brit going to japan i i felt much too big mm. and i felt like i was all constantly like invading people's space and that i was breaking all the rules all the time whereas then i come to france and i feel like everyone is is invading my space it's mm. like i just can't ha- i can't get used to it yeah you should have gone for a, to a transition com- country i think maybe maybe somewhere in the north jersey <laughs> yeah. one of the channel islands yeah yeah they're probably a bit more polite aren't they i don't know but um in japan do they apologize all the time as well um that's like yeah, culture yeah yeah, yeah 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 there's a lot of ah ah ah, 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 ah lots of, that kind bow. of ah, lots of bowing and uh you know sorry sorry to interrupt you so there she must sorry <laughs> yeah there's quite a lot of that do yeah. you know the book watching the english have you oh, ever yes. read it yeah kate fox yeah yeah and she says that the Japanese, are, she, she tried an experiment where she was bumping into people in the street <laughs> and um, to see the reaction. Whereas, so when she bumped into English people, even if it wasn't, or well, British people, even if it wasn't their fault, they would apologise. Whereas if she bumped into, obviously, French people, they would not apologise, etc., cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And But she said the only people that were, were worse than, on, not really worse, but um, different to the British were the Japanese because they would actually dodge her. She couldn't actually bump into them they'd move too quickly yeah isn't that amazing it is like it, it's almost like um japanese people have magnets <laughs> attached <laughs> yeah. to themselves to each other Maybe, and they yeah. just like repel each other yeah and so they, they're, in, yeah, they're incredibly good at sort of um uh, not bumping into each other it's true <laughs> it must be very restful being there Oh, I don't know because from, from that point of view but i mean i've uh, i've seen some incredibly crowded yeah situations don't they have people that cram people onto the trains yes so yeah. i used to get the train every day to work and uh yeah some days you would be squeezed like pressed up against the glass mm. in the trains and i've you know there's video footage of of men in uniforms with white gloves on and they and they're pushing people into the train cars but then you must arrive at work super sweaty and yeah Oh, I had Rumpley. some. Oh, I had some rough mornings. Mm. Uh, but I mean, I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, you know, if you live there, if you grew up there, and if you, you're less volu- voluminous, <laughs> if you're quite petite. Uh, if you're a sort of a smaller Japanese person, you imagine uh, being so squashed in that you can't breathe out. You have to breathe in. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that uh, I think that it's horrible for them. I, mm. I, I imagine. You know, uh, who? How could it not be? It's, I, I find it amazing that they managed to make it work, though, because if that was in France, everyone would be fighting and arguing. Yeah, yeah. In those situations, I've seen situations where the trains are very crowded, like, mm. for example, if going to a concert um, or a football game and everyone suddenly gets onto the metro. Yeah, there's and the tr- not enough discipline as and well. And then you just yeah. see arguments. People are shouting at each other mm. and arguing. Also, I noticed that when you get off the train in in Paris on the metro, people get off the train and then they're just like wondering, you know, people aren't aware necessarily that there's other people around mm. and people get off the plat- get off the train onto the platform and they stop <laughs> and they look around well, or they're kissing each other that's goodbye. like people that stop at the top of escalators. Um, ah! Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's in London just as well. Quite dangerous. Yeah. yeah, people just like getting to the to the tr- uh, train gates and uh, and stopping, and then all of London has to stop behind them. <laughs> yeah, th- th- lots of that kind of but, thing. But um, this was something that annoyed Scarlett Johansson when she was here. She's a friend of mine. Ha 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 ha. Lol. But, yeah, lol. <laughs> she said that um, people walking along the pavement, um, they won't, they don't move out of the way. You know, like if a couple are walking on the pavement, holding their hands and holding hands. And there's only the room for the couple on the pa- that 
that width of pavement because French pavements, Parisian pavements are very, very narrow and you're coming towards them. They don't anticipate the fact that another person might want to stay on the pavement. And so it's basically a who's going to be the strongest one and you usually lose on that one. I lose all the time. I cannot yeah. walk down the street here. I mean, it's in, you know, I talk mm. about that in my stand-up. I just can't walk down the street. And um, I'm always the one who's dodging. I'm, I'm, yeah. but I walk twice the distance as, uh, uh, as everyone else. <laughs> you know, I'm walking twice the distance because I'm going round. I'm snaking around through everyone. Yeah. But you know what? It comes because when I first arrived in Paris, I'd come from a small town in Spain. And before that, I come from, you know, a little village in England. And so just to cross the road, I couldn't negotiate the other people, you know, and I was scared that I was going to end up in the middle of the pedestrian crossing and the light the, the would turn mm. green for the cars and I'd just be crushed, you know, yeah. because I couldn't get a, I couldn't work out. And it does come. And I've noticed that when you go to some stations and the barriers for going in and out are badly positioned, so you end up having to do and it ends up like a sort of ballet you know, people kind of can anticipate the speed at which the other ones are walking and you cross over just at the right moment. And it is quite, you know, poetic. I totally get almost. that. But my problem is I like to walk fast. I, yeah, I walk too. faster than most people. I mean, mm. you're the same as me then. Walk fast. I like to pace around at high speed. Yeah, and and uh, uh, other pedestrians don't, they cannot judge it because they, they you know, suddenly I'm a part, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> Behind them. Or Behind in, you. you know, we're walking, walking yeah. towards each other and they don't realise how fast I'm walking. Mm. And then, you know. You, just you have to learn the art of huffing and puffing though, don't you? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't want to be one of those. <sighs> I found myself doing people. that now and again. And I think, oh, I really am French now. <laughs> I do that. I don't like doing that. I don't no. want to be, I don't want to walk around with a miserable look on my face, huffing and puffing. I know. Yeah. I, I used to make a joke about um, not looking my age and that, uh, do you want to know the secret? It's uh, smiling. <laughs> you should you try, try it, it sometime. Yeah. In fact, no, I said it was laughing. And I said that um, most people, especially French people say they laugh inside. And there's actually you no know, utility to that whatsoever, you know. <laughs> But we love France, though, don't we? Come on. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Are, what are the things you love about this place? Um, the cheese. <laughs> no, I love the food, obviously, and the, and the restaurants and the lifestyle. Um, I had two children here. I, you know, there was a lot of stuff that's free for kids. <laughs> yeah. You know that there is the very it's a big nanny state. Yeah. Well, that's great. Which it, is good. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you have children, you know they. They balance out your taxes according to the number of children you have. I don't think we do that in every country. No. They've um, got fantastic health care. Great health. It's the best. In, yeah. One of the best in the world, yeah. probably. Yeah. I remember a, a friend of mine was interviewed when um, Michael Moore came over to talk about, I, I think it was specifically to talk about health care. Yeah. All the camera crew, they were talking about the 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 benefits that you got when you were on maternity leave. And all the camera crew and all the crew, she said they were just like what <laughs> you know when she was explaining what they had you yeah. know they were going but but you you get this time off you get paid and because so michael moore's an american filmmaker yeah and he, uh, listeners he was mm. making um a documentary about the american healthcare system mm. and comparing it to healthcare systems in europe and basically all the americans were like what yeah. i can't believe uh, the the benefits that you get yeah. from your health this was system. the camera crew and this was pre-obamacare i think wasn't it yeah. Because then they brought in Obamacare and then it went again. It's unbelievable to me that uh, Amer like some Americans uh, are so strongly against, um, um, you know, state health care. I just mm. don't, I can't comprehend that. I, for me, it's just an absolutely basic part of being in a society. But you see, we had that in, in Britain. We had the National Health Service and their motto is from the cradle to the grave. So we were we were used to that. What, one fun thing I found difficult when I came to France is you have to pay at the end of a con consultation with a doctor, and I'd often forget to do that. <laughs> so they, and they were like, to, "Oh, uh, uh, um, yeah. uh, excuse me, madame." Uh. Or, or once I had a, a minor operation on my eye, and I went away without paying. And the next time I saw the guy, he said, but "You went away without paying," and it was like, "A, I just had a minor operation on my eye. It's not the first thing I think of, and B, it's just not in me. You know, I just." Yeah. Now I I remember to pay, but you know, 
You do have to pay a bit. It's subsidised later. You get reimbursed, yeah. Or you have to stick your card in somewhere now. Well, you pay and then you have to do loads of paperwork later. Oh, yes. So much we paperwork. Love that. Yeah. One other thing I, lo- I love about France... Sorry, I'm No, go I'm on. You tell in. me something. One thing I love about France is the um, just the countryside, the landscape. Oh, yeah. It's got... It, I mean, it's got everything, this country. Mm. It's got all of it. It's got, you know, obviously down south, the sort of Mediterranean. You've got the Atlantic coast. You've got the northern coast. You've got mountains in the Alps. You've got, uh, you know, flatlands. Big, big way. Waves, big waves cold water <laughs> yeah but Warm you've got water. all different types of landscape mm. and some incredibly beautiful places it's uh, it's wonderfully beautiful There's so many places to discover my parents used to come camping here a lot and they know france super well you know they they go camping in all different areas and tell me all the stories about the places that i never got to visit haven't visited yet you mm. know mm. they knew france much better than i did and so we were lucky because we were in france with the COVID crisis and we could go on holiday in France. We were allowed to move around in the summer. And so um, a lot of French people were discovering their own countries as well. They're all the wonderful places that they could go. Yeah. I actually went to Vendée. I'd never been there before. So Vendée is a part of France with long sandy beaches. It's famous for being a bit windy, but it wasn't windy at all this summer. So lovely. Vendée, doesn't it mean windy? <laughs> Not, no, I don't think it's the name of the area. What, what's windy in French? Venteux, would uh, be, wouldn't it? Something like that. Uh, okay. Similar though, isn't it? Yeah. But it's vent, isn't it? Vent is wind. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was windy. It's mm. like, very <laughs> pragmatic name. But no, it's not. It's not that. No. What about what about the UK? Do you do you get to? Obviously, you can't now. But uh, do you get to go back there sometimes? Yes, I try and go back. Now we have the Eurostar. I mean, when I first came to France, there, there was no internet, no Eurostar. You know, I was pretty cut off from England mm. at the time. Yeah. But uh, now we have the Eurostar. I, I have a sister that lives in London, so I can go and visit her and easily get to Stratford. Well, easily. I can get a slow old train <laughs> to Stratford. Yeah, the Chiltern line. Or <laughs> oh, something. that one's a killer, No, We don't even do that anymore. Rail replacement bus service. <laughs> I'm surprised. You know, Shakespeare was born there. They could have a better train line, couldn't they? The UK's trains are a nightmare. Yeah, that's one good thing about France. French people complain about their trains, but I say, no, the TGV is fantastic. French trains are brilliant. And not so expensive. I love French trains. I love French trains. Oh. That person loves trains too. That is too. my phone, but I thought it was on silent. I do apologise. Someone's trying to call me and I'm not answering. They can wait. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree with you. I love um, all the different places in France. What were we talking about? Going we, back to the going UK. Going back to the UK, yes. So um, I went back to the UK this summer. We were supposed to be going on a family holiday to Ireland, but my brother lives in the US, so he couldn't get here. And they also had a two-week quarantine in uh, Ireland. Mm. Now this is... Yeah, I don't know. Um, so with my daughter, we decided to go to England anyway yep, yep, to yep. see my family. And we arrived on the Thursday, the day when they announced that, they would, that people would have to quarantine coming from France. Sorry, you arrived in... In England. In England, in, the day yeah. that they announced the quarantine. Yeah. So did you manage to avoid the quarantine? We did, yeah. Okay, just by a... By a by, yeah, so a it, basically... Breadth. Yeah. But basically, it was coming into place on the Saturday morning, and we'd arrived on the Thursday. So oh, all of Brits had to rush back to get back in time to not have to go into quarantine for 14 days yeah. before three o'clock Saturday morning or something okay. ridiculous like so you, that. You just missed so we it. We just got in. And when we went to Britain, they had this kind of track and trace system. We had to say what place we were in the train, um, where we were staying. We had to give phone numbers, dates, and so on. Very logical. It went into a big computer system. And we had to prove that we'd done this um, in on the Paris side, showing the train people that we'd done this. So we were covered. When they announced the quarantine rules in England, France said, we're going to do the same back. And so we were a little bit worried, because we were only staying for a week, that we would have to quarantine when we got back to France. Right. So we were desperately watching social media and you know all the newspapers. Nothing happened, nothing happened. So we eventually stayed for a week, had a very nice time in England. Weather wasn't good that week, unfortunately, but it had been nice up to then yeah. for them. Yeah. And when we went back, we had to fill in a form saying, um, so we had to print out a form. When you, yeah, when you came, we back to France, came back to France, yeah. saying that I, on my honour, sign this form saying that I've not been in contact with people who have the following symptoms oh. and signing it on my honour, which is not in a computer system at all. Nobody wanted to see my form. Nobody asked to see it. They no train authorities. Nobody. No one cared. No one cared. Okay. Uh, is this good or bad? I don't know. Well, it, if I had been a super spreader, 
<laughs> no one would have known. I mean, they would have lost my trace once I got back to France. So it's bad in the sense that it seemed to be pretty irresponsible on the French side, yeah. but good in the sense that you didn't have to quarantine. Yeah, swings but and it, roundabouts. But wouldn't have had to quarantine anyway because they never actually did it. They just threatened to do it. Right. So you see, the oh, whole thing they, was weird. It was like a threat. Like, there's a lot of weird diplomatic stuff going on exactly. between Exactly. They thought, well, we're going to have to reciprocate. But they never really did. It's going to get complicated, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of next year. Oh, my goodness. After the transition period ends. But let's not do Brexit now. We're not doing Brexit. Not I don't want do to Brexit. talk about Brexit. We can't. Life we can't is already depressing enough. Yes, it is. Um, so, well, Elspeth, I think that's probably our time. Oh, it seemed to go so quickly, Luke. It, it, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Time flies. Time flies. When you're podcasting. In podcast land. Yeah, maybe it's a different time. Or maybe you didn't pay for your time. <laughs> you didn't pay Accurist. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Accurist has been um, messing with the clocks or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but it's been really nice to talk to you. Are you yes. doing any shows at all coming um, up? Nothing special. A lot of things have been cancelled. And I must say I'm a bit reluctant, a bit reticent about trying to force people to come and see me on stage in not very safe areas. So I do have a show planned, I think, but my next show is on the 31st of October uh, in English. You're just doing spots at the moment, right? Sort of yeah. like uh, yeah. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 5 minutes, whatever. Exactly. Um, I'm too lazy to put together an hour show. Yeah. And at the moment, it's not the the time to do that. You've never considered doing your own show, though? Uh, I did do a show with a friend, uh, Alex Killian. We we did uh, 30 minutes each. Yeah. But what we neither of us liked was uh, trying to bully people to come and see us. It's very, very hard work, the marketing, unless you're super successful immediately, which we obviously weren't. <laughs> 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 so... Yes, when you're mediocre, <laughs> it's, well, it's not so easy. It's hard for almost everyone except Paul Taylor, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Because he had that pow, that Paul Taylor effect. I was going effect. to say, I'm sure he had times when it was hard, but I don't think he did, did he? But most stand-upers say that they had, you know, hard times where they... But he didn't. He just went straight. <laughs> well, Paul, I feel... I mean, I've talked about this before. Okay, here's like a Paul Taylor coda for, for this <laughs> conversation. Uh, Paul is, uh, is unique, isn't he? Because, yeah. well, first of all... Um, uh, Marie Connolly was uh, saying this uh, the other day to me that he he made a decision. You mm. know, he went all in. Yeah. He he he, he uh, quit his job at Apple, and so he was all in. And so that obviously, when you throw yourself into it completely, the chances are that you're going to get more success. Or well, you know, not necessarily. Not necessarily, but you know <laughs> but, what I mean. Like, but there is a good system here for what social sa- security. <laughs> what I'm saying is, he focused all his time and energy. Yeah. And his mental uh, energy and stuff on on doing that, and he was he's very organised. He learnt a lot from his time at Apple mm. um, in terms of like uh, his writing process, his his uh, the way he organises his material. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he extru- works super hard. He works incredibly hard. Um, he is very efficient and all that stuff. Plus the fact that um, um, he um, obviously he's, he, you know he's coming up with all the right observations and stuff, but because he speaks French so so well so like a native he's kind of weird because he's like a ninja or something because he says it himself yeah, he? yeah he's like um an English person but he's also a French person in a sense to me when I listened to him speaking French I remember listening to an interview with him once and I thought he sounds like he's translating English into French but into perfect French it's really weird I could tell yeah you know I, I it, what he was saying didn't sound 100% natural but in his, French, but his pronunciation was perfect. Yeah. It's funny, that, isn't that, it? Whereas that, it's never going to happen to me. <laughs> I think that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating, but maybe the French are so flattered, they're so um, uh, pleased that an English person speaks French so well mm. that they love him, you know? And, yeah. and he's obviously so funny and charming and sweet and everything too. But he's just kind of got all the, it's, it's like... He's got all I, the ingredients. He's got all the ingredients, exactly. He's a cake. <laughs> yeah, he's a really good cake. and he's the, a he's, cake that's risen. <laughs> and the, uh, for the French, it's like the, it's all the things that the French yeah. want in a cake. Absolutely. <laughs> and yet he's British. <laughs> I know, yeah. He's, he's, we, yeah. he's a the, British French cake. I know, he's a British cake. But <laughs> the French people are like, wait a minute, like this it. cake oh. is so delicious. But it's British. You Whoa! can't put carrots in a cake. And then they're telling their friends, come and see this British cake, it's delicious. <laughs> and they're like, what? It's the, not possible. The British cake that's delicious. <laughs> and, you know, they're queuing up around the block to see this cake. We do have good cakes, though. In the UK? Yeah. Hell yeah. Mm. We we certainly do. And pies. Mm, yum, 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 yum. 
Okay. <laughs> on that on that note, la- ladies and gentlemen. Let's go and eat some cake, shall we, Let's go and eat some cake. Or let's Mark. have our cake and eat it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so that was my conversation with Elspeth. I enjoyed it a lot, especially because we have quite a lot in common, not least because we're from the same neck of the woods. And by the way, your neck of the woods is the local area where you live, okay? It's like your little part of a certain area, okay? So how did you get on with that? Did you manage to follow it all okay? Well, I suppose you must have done because you made it. You're here now. You've caught up with the train. Uh, You can have a rest now, if you like. Well done for keeping up. Here you go. Here's a cup of tea and some nice chocolate biscuits. Yum, yum, yum. I expect you're you're probably getting your phone out now, aren't you? That's, you know, generally what people do when they just finish doing something in that little period. Oh, what shall I do now? I'll get my phone out. If that's what you're doing, if you've got your phone out now, then open up Instagram on your phone, if you've got it, and check out Elspeth's page there, which is at Els Lost in France. That's E-L-S Lost in France on Instagram. Okay, which Lost in France, I now realise that would have been the perfect name for this episode, wouldn't it? It's too late now um, to go back. Right, so I could do a lot of rambling on now uh, about all sorts of things, like what's been going on and the Wispolep competition. I've got all sorts of things in my head, lots of things that I feel like I need to say and get out there, um, including, yes, the Wispolep competition, which is now closed, by the way. I think in almost every part of the world it's closed, depending on what time it is where you are now. But um, basically, the Wispolep competition is closed now. No more entries, please. The deadline has passed. Unless maybe, as I said, you're in a part of the world where it's still the 15th of October, in which case you have until midnight. But for everyone else, the competition is now closed. And so the door's closed. No more entries. And I know there's one person going, but wait, I thought it was the 31st of October. Yeah, you missed all the announcements. You missed all the other things or you weren't listening or maybe you were, I don't know what you were doing, dealing with something, fighting a bear. That's one, In fact, that's one of the things that one of the contestants mentions, fighting a bear, because apparently this is something that all Russian people have to do from time to time. Not that you're all Russian, and, and I'm not making the joke now. Oh, I got an email. Um, the, the person who sent the email knows who, who it is. And by the way, the, your email was very nice. You said some very nice things, okay? Uh, but I have to say also that you completely misunderstood the Russian joke. Don't feel bad. Please don't feel bad. There's nothing to feel bad about. It's okay. People misunderstand things. That's the business that we're in here, isn't it? But um, I did get an email from someone who just completely misunderstood the Russian joke again. And so I, I do feel obliged to say, you know what? The Russian joke is, it, there is no comment about Russian people especially not the Russian government. There's absolutely, it's got absolutely nothing to do with Russian people, okay? It's not a comment on Russian people. That's not the joke, okay? I can't believe I'm explaining this again, but I am. The joke is not a comment about Russian people or about the or about the, the nature of Russian people or the government or anything, nothing. It is simply a word joke, a pun, okay? Um, all right? So I'm, I'm not going to say any more, but if you if you think there is a subtext to this joke, the Russian joke, if you think there's a subtext to it, if you think that I'm making a comment, I'm not, right? Okay, good. Oh, dear. Um, where was I? So the Wispolep competition. I've received loads of entries, okay? And let me tell you, it's going to be difficult to choose just one winner. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to episode 681. There are there are so many really interesting recordings that I've been sent and little stories of how people learned English and all kinds of other things. Um, it will be very hard to pick just one person to be interviewed. Um, also, I'm, I'm now wondering how I'm going to manage the whole thing. I've had nearly 90 entries. I don't know why I didn't expect to get so many. Um, but anyway, I've had nearly 90. And each entry is about two minutes long. So, well, that's what, like 180 minutes. 
even without my comments. And I really want to make even very short comments after each one, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. So about 180 minutes worth. I don't know quite what I'm going to do. I'm working on it. Shall I play them all on the podcast? That is quite a lot, isn't it? If that would be five half an hour episodes without any other comments from me, and I, I would like to make some other comments. Hmm, I'm thinking about it. I think maybe the best way to do it might be to make a YouTube video of all of the audio, if that makes sense. You know, just use a static image, but have the audio um, on YouTube, put it on YouTube. And then I can add timestamps for each person. Because YouTube's good like that. It allows you to add little chapter markers, which are quite easy to navigate. That will make it much easier for everyone to find each recording. You know, for example, if anyway, I might do that. In any case, I will find a way to manage this. It could take a while, though, so be patient. Okay, so the next stage of the competition is coming. I'm just working on it. I'm sure people are going to send their, their suggestions and things, which would be great. I, I can't guarantee I'll be able to, to, to do the suggestion that you send to me. I'm working on it, okay? Don't worry, I've got this, okay? Right, so I do want to restate, though, that it's been amazing listening to all the uh, recordings, okay? I've had brief listens to most of the recordings which have been sent to me, and I just want to say thank you to those of you who have sent recordings. There are some amazing people in in my audience, and I, I just want to give a shout-out to anyone who sent in a recording. Well done for plucking up the courage to do that. Some of you are now kicking yourselves, going, oh, I didn't do it. Damn it. Well, sorry. Rules are rules. The competition is going to be a bit of a celebration of my audience from around the world, I think. Okay, so there's not much more to add here except the usual mention of Luke's English Podcast Premium, which you can find out more about by going to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. I've been getting some very positive feedback about it, I'm glad to say. There are now over 100 episodes of Luke's English Podcast Premium in audio and video form uh, to help you work on your vocab, grammar and pronunciation. Check it out to see what you've been missing, okay? Um, The link is in the um, description in the show notes for this episode. I'll be back again soon with another episode, perhaps one in which I just ramble on about all the stuff I've been meaning to say on the podcast for a while, all the stuff that's in my head. I've got like a few listener emails I'd like to read out, some songs maybe I'd like to play on the guitar and stuff like that. So uh, we'll see. But I've I've got some more interviews as well planned which um, will be coming up on the podcast soon. Let me say thank you again to Elspeth for her contribution to this episode. Thank you, Elspeth. Everyone, hang in there in the world, okay? I know that we, I I guess that um, in your country, I wouldn't be surprised if the government is imposing more and more measures to try to deal with this virus that we've got going on. Yes, there is a virus. Have you heard about it? Some, Some of you are listening to this from like years into the future you know because that off that often happens like it, people don't just listen to this in the weeks after i publish it some people listen they don't catch up with these episodes until years later so if you are in the future i wonder what the world is like and what do you think of what what are your thoughts on what we've all been going through now Ah, um, I well, that's that would be interesting to know. If you if you are from the future and you've got a time machine, come back and let us know, or don't. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe it's best if you, we just don't know. <sighs> oh dear. Anyway, hang in there, everyone. Keep your chin up. We're going to be all right. We're going to get through this. Okay, we are. It's going to be all right. Hey, everyone. Would you like to hear some anti-COVID funk music to cheer you up? And of course, you're all going, yes, Luke, definitely. Anti-COVID funk music. Obviously, music... (laughs) We know, don't we, music... Well, maybe music can help if it lifts your spirits, makes you feel good. That's important, isn't it? Because that, I'm sure that's beneficial for your immune system. You know, we've got to try and maintain positivity and a healthy uh, life, okay, To, to help us. It's not just about washing our hands and all and wearing masks and things. It's also about staying positive and trying to just feel, you know, trying to maintain a positive outlook. Anyway, for me, music is really important for that. 
And um, anyway, this morning I, I recorded something. Yeah, myself. I recorded some music. I probably should have been doing some work, but after dropping off my daughter at school and coming home, I suddenly felt compelled to play some music. I wanted to play some bass and one thing led to another and I ended up recording a little two minute funk groove. So you're, I'm going to play it to you now. It's just about two minutes long. The drums are from a YouTuber called Dimitri Fantini, who is a drummer on YouTube. And you can check the link to his, um, his channel on uh, the page for this episode. Um, and um, so that's where I got the drums from, is Dimitri Fantini. I needed a 90 beats per minute, a 90 BPM, 16 beat funk groove. 16 beats, that's one that goes... That's 16 beats to the bar. Okay? Eight beats would be... One, two, three... Now that's at four or eight. Anyway, 16 beats is... It's got that going on, right? 16 beats to the bar. So I needed a 16-beat funk groove, about 90 beats per minute. I just looked it up on YouTube and I found Dimitri Fantini and he delivered. So credit to Dimitri for the drum track, which is really nicely recorded and really nice to play over the top of. I've, I've added uh, bass guitar using my Mexican-made Fender P bass. Shout out to the people of Mexico. I've got a Mexican-made Fender Precision bass. And also I added some rhythm guitar with my Fender Stratocaster. The, the, the Stratocaster was a gift from my wife. Thank you, my lovely wife, for, for, for that. Um, an anniversary gift. And the bass guitar was a, a present I offered to myself during lockdown, one of those lockdown, a lockdown um, purchase. So bass guitar, a bit of rhythm guitar, with a Fender Stratocaster, also made in Mexico. Double shout out to the people of Mexico. Hello. And also I've added some string sounds a little bit from my Yamaha P45 electric piano. I'm probably talking about it far too much, but um, indulge me. Anyway, I called the track Funk in the Kitchen because it's supposed to make you dance in your kitchen or indeed in any other location. So brace yourselves, all right? Music is coming. Some of Some people are asleep now because they 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 fell asleep at some point during the episode so this might wake them up and maybe whoa they'll start dancing in their bed i don't know but um so i'll say bye-bye to you after this uh, but brace yourselves because music is coming in 5 4 3 2 1 let the funk commence
There you go. Did I wake you up? Sorry if you were sleeping. I don't know. Maybe some of you had a little dance. I hope so. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I will speak to you again on the podcast soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.